Yeah, welcome to Affiliate Summit. Thanks for coming out pretty early today. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, WordPress speed and conversion rate optimization. Got two experts here with me, uh, Willie Jackson and David Bogenfold. Uh, they are two of the smartest guys when it comes to speed optimization that I know. And as we all know, um, I'm pretty sure a couple years ago, if I would have raised, uh, asked who uses WordPress uh, on their website, most people would have said, I, I do. And I'm pretty sure in this room, uh, almost everyone uses WordPress. So um, today we're going to talk about, it's going to be some, some technical and some less technical um, as far as how to speed up your website because that impacts uh, your conversion rates right off the, right off the top. So I'll let Willie uh, introduce himself and then David, and then we'll jump into the meat of it. Hey there, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Willie Jackson. I lead the performance team at W3Edge, which is a company that uh, specializes in web development and uh, performance solutions for WordPress. Uh, we have a plugin called W3 Total Cache that you might have heard of, and uh, I run paid support for that. Um, I'm not really sure what else we say here besides favorite colors and whatnot, so I'll turn it over to David. Uh, my name is David Vogelpohl. I run a company in Austin, Texas called Marketing Click, and one of our main focuses is optimizing WordPress specifically for speed in terms of desktop and mobile browsers. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, go ahead and kick off. So um, I'm going to do our first presentation here, and I'm going to talk to you about 10 ways you can make WordPress faster, and I'm going to try to give you guys some uh, tactical advice that you can take back. Um, to your website and get some immediate improvements to your speed. So for those of you that don't know me, um, again, my name is David Vogelpohl. I run actually two companies in Austin, Marketing Click and Tapfire Mobile. And again, our main focus is, or one of our main focuses is uh, WordPress optimization. I've had the pleasure to speak about WordPress optimization at Affiliate Summit in Austin, Texas, at WordCamp in Atlanta. Um, and I'm a previous contributor to Feedfront and Marketing Pilgrim. Um, before I get started, can I get a show of hands? How many uh, custom web developers do we have in the audience? Okay, a couple of guys back there. Um, what about WordPress ninjas? You know a lot about WordPress. You spend a lot of time optimizing your site. Um, a couple more hands. And then publishers or business owners that know a little bit but outsource the development to other people. Okay, great. So I'm going to cover some tips that really focus on all groups. And so what I'd like you to do is grab a pen, um, write down some of this information, and if you need to take it back to your developers, um, I'm going to give you basically bullet points that you can take back. Um, so we're going to get somewhat technical, but I'm going to give you digestible information that you can take back to your development team um, to help you out if you don't have the resources to handle this um, yourself. So. Um, I am going to be referencing some links during the presentation. I'm actually auto-tweeting them, thanks to Hootsuite, um, with the hashtag ASC12. So if you're following on Twitter, you can grab these links um, through Twitter. And before you get started in optimizing your WordPress site for speed, you really need a baseline. And what I'm going to talk about first is a tool that you can use to set that baseline. And that tool is webpagetest.org. What you're going to do is you're going to go to webpagetest.org, you're going to enter your website, and you're going to click Run Test. And when you run the test, you're going to access what's called the waterfall view. And that's the view that you're looking at here. And I've highlighted some areas on the screen, and I'm going to talk about them in general terms. Um, we could probably spend a few hours talking about each one of these components. But the first is the, the score on the upper right-hand corner. And I ran this test on CNN. Um, because they have a really busy website that's very dynamic, and I knew they would have a poor score for a lot of these things. Um, but you can see the you know A through F scores for first byte, keep alive, enabled, compression for text and images, uh, whether there's caching of static content and a CDN. Um, uh, you'll find detailed information on this on webpagetest.org, but this will show you the primary areas of your site that you should address before you really move on to anything else. The second area I'd like you to focus on is the second box where document complete and fully loaded. And this is really the base metric. And this tells you how fast it took your website to load. Your target is under two seconds, and obviously you want it as fast as possible, um, but definitely no more than three seconds. Um, so when you go to optimize your page, or if you want to determine if your page is loading quickly enough, um, look at these numbers. And again, you're looking to give it under two seconds, um, worst case, under three seconds. So pretty much, if, if you've never looked at this page, what should someone be looking for? Um, again, it depends on, so basically, once you look at the overall metric of your speed, the next thing you look is the waterfall view. And what you see in the waterfall view is how long it takes each individual element on your website to load. 
And that's the third um, highlighted box down there. And what this will do is help illustrate um, elements of your website which are taking a long time to load. In CNN's case, you can see these two items in that orange box are very large images. And so um, what you might consider in this case would be reducing the size of those images or eliminating them or compressing them or um, using a CDN um, to cache them. Um, but essentially um, what you want to do is go through each line item. And again, this depends on your level of um, technical capabilities. Um, you might have to you know, point your developers to this resource, but again, it, each line item will show you how long it takes to load, and it might require a different course of action for each item. Um, again, we're not going to go through point by point, but this will help illustrate the parts of your website which are taking the longest time to load and adding to your overall page load time. Um, so again, under three seconds, um, ideally under two seconds, and then look at the individual light items in the waterfall view to determine which elements of the web page are causing um, your page load time to be high. Um, the next thing we want to do when we optimize um, sites for speed, the first thing we look at is where they're hosted. In an ideal situation, what you want is a dedicated server or really dedicated servers in a clustered environment or a virtual private server, a VPS, um, of course, you want strong SLAs and resource guarantees and all the great things that go along with that. Um, and again, this is something we probably talk about for a couple of days, but you also want to optimize things like Apache, um, the caching on the server, the way the databases are handled. So if you don't have the technical resources to optimize all of these components on a dedicated server environment or a VPS, um, what you want to look at maybe is a shared host. And not a shared host like in terms of GoDaddy or Bluehost, but maybe like a managed WordPress host. Uh, managed WordPress hosts deal exclusively in hosting WordPress websites, so those optimizations on Apache and caching and databases, um, they have all that fine-tuned specifically for WordPress. Also their uh, hosting environment, I'm sorry, their support group deals with WordPress every day. So um, if you're asking a question, chances are they've heard it before and they're going to give you nice solid answers rather than contacting a host that deals with Joomla and Drupal. and who knows what other content management systems. Um, they live, breathe, and eat WordPress. Um, the three main providers in that area are Pagely, ZippyKit, and WP Engine. Uh, for full, full disclosure, WP Engine is actually a client of mine, but all three providers are excellent choices um, in terms of hosting your WordPress website. Um, the next thing that will get you an immediate impact in terms of your speed is a CDN. And what a CDN is, it's a content distribution network. And what that means is that there are servers located all over the world, um, LA, New York, Denver, Houston, Sydney, London, and these servers store parts of your website, mainly static parts of your website, images, um, static pages. Um, and when the visitor goes to download your website, they download those static components from that local server. And what that means is that's a reduced hops, reduced steps between the content and your visitor, which reduces latency and increases page load time. Also, by serving the static content from these servers, it reduces the load on your primary web server, which means that you can handle more traffic and you can serve that traffic more efficiently. Um, so you definitely, definitely, definitely want to make sure to have a CDN running on your site. Um, the next thing you want to do is check for W3C compliance. And what W3C is, it's the organization that sets the standards for HTML. It's the way, it's what browser developers are supposed to uh, use in terms of writing their uh, browsers to render the content. And if you go to validator.w3.org, um, you can enter your web page address and it will run a check and give you a line item of each um, HTML component on your website. Um, that is not standard with W3. Um, now, not every site's going to be perfect and sometimes you're going to have errors, but your goal, of course, is to not have any errors when you run it through the validator. Um, who here loves JavaScript? Does anybody like JavaScript other than me? Okay, so <laughs> that guy back there. Um, so JavaScript's awesome, right? We use it with tracking scripts for like Google Analytics. Um, but JavaScript can be another element that can get your web pages into trouble. Um, we deal with a lot of clients who have uh, multiple tracking scripts from multiple different analytics packages, Google Analytics, Mixpanel, Conversion Ruler, and they signed up for these free trials and put these tracking scripts on their site and they never check the reports that go with them. They're checking just Google Analytics or just one of the other packages, but they've left all these tracking scripts on their site. Um, 
A-B testing scripts and things like that. So what you want to do is if you have a lot of these scripts that you've installed over time, remove them. Run an audit. Remove these excess tracking scripts from your site. Um, JavaScript is also great for dynamic elements on a web page, right? If you want to change out the title or the sidebar, depending on where a visitor came from, JavaScript can, can be a big help there, but it can also slow down how quickly your page renders and how quickly the visitor can see the content that you're trying to display. So um, if you find that JavaScript is getting in the way of your page loading, consider making those static elements. Instead of a slideshow, um, think of a static image. Instead of swapping out that title or that sidebar, maybe forego that um, if it's getting in the way of the content rendering for your visitors. Um, this is kind of developer 101, but you definitely want to place all your JavaScript below the closing body tag. Now, analytics packages will tell you to put it uh, right before the closing body tag. That's fine. Um, but what you don't want to do is you don't want to put that in the head or above your content because what's going to happen in the browser is that JavaScript's going to load first and then your content's going to load. So it's going to be a slower experience for the visitor. Um, images, that's another big way you can get your um, page load times a lot lower. Um, and I put the picture of the iPhone up there because as bloggers, we've all been at a conference or something and snapped a photo with our iPhone and, and emailed it to ourselves and um, then posted that on our blog. If you're resizing your images with HTML, if you're setting the height and width and keeping the original image size, you know, an, an image size email from your phone is like one to three megs, um, what's gonna happen is it's gonna render it in that smaller size, but the actual image is still gonna be a meg large. Um, we had a client that had super, super slow, like 11 second page um, load time, and they had a header image that was about 728 by 90. Well, they had resized it with HTML, but the original image was like 1,000 pixels by 2,000 pixels. So we were able to reduce their page load time by about 2 thirds just by making that image the actual size that the customer was using it in. Um, so definitely go into image editing software and resize your images to be the size that you're going to use um, when they're on the live page. Um, you also want to remove metadata. Um, excess metadata from the images and you want to use JPEGs in place of PNG when you can. Um, certainly in certain situations um, PNG is going to display the images um, in, in a way that's clear for the visitor but um, when you can use JPEGs. And then there's a plugin called WP Smush It and um, you can use that for image optimization and uh, I know Mr. Willie has some feedback here that we'll discuss later on that particular plugin. Um, but um, definitely the main point here is to use images the size that you're actually going to display them with. Um, speaking of images, so this is getting a little more technical. So if you're not a developer, write this down and go back and ask your developers about, about it. But it's um, CSS sprites. And what this has to deal with, if we think back to the waterfall view that we looked at earlier on webpagetest.org, um, we saw all those little elements of, of different pieces of content loading. So what was happening there is that there were HTTP requests going back to the server requesting those images. And so what CSS sprites allow us to do is basically send a single HTTP request to the server. And when we reduce HTTP, HTTP requests, we increase page load time. Um, you can try spriteme.org. Um, which will automatically create these sprites for you. And then uh, if you want to read all about it, again, write this down. And again, I'm auto-tweeting all these links, um, css-tricks.com forward slash CSS sprites. And there's great documentation there about how to use um, CSS sprites. This is a huge sin that a lot of webmasters uh, are guilty of, and that's plugins. Um, I love plugins, they're awesome. You go to the plugin directory, you search for something you wanna do, and um, they can solve some pretty complicated problems by, by the simple click of the button. But the way I like to equate this is a GeoCities website, right? We all remember GeoCities with the dancing babies and the animated cakes and fireworks. Um, think of plugins like that. The more of these little elements you add to your WordPress site, the slower it's going to load, the worse the performance is going to be, and the more security vulnerabilities you introduce to your website. Um, the less plugins you have, the faster your website will load. And that is separate and apart from um, what happens with misbehaving plugins. Um, misbehaving plugins can pound your server with HTTP requests. You can unnecessarily write information to the database. Um, we had a client recently that was writing tons of information to the database um, through a plugin um, that we subsequently had to remove that 
significantly increase their page load time, um, out of control database queries. Um, there are security vulnerabilities with some plugins and that can open your site up to malware distribution which can slow down your page load time let alone the negative connotations of distributing malware, things like getting banned from Google and just being a bad um, citizen of the net. Uh, another tip is if you're going to go audit your plugins and remove old ones that you've uh, installed in the past, make sure to delete them and not just deactivate them. Um, deactivating them won't always um, circumvent any security vulnerabilities which were introduced. Um, another thing, and this goes primarily for bloggers, but anybody making lists of posts or pages, um, don't show the full post in your post lists. Um, this is also good for SEO. Um, you might want to consider removing social buttons from your post list. If you think about it from your visitor's perspective, are they really going to read your title and first paragraph and then tweet or Facebook about it? Um, these buttons have JavaScript and images um, associated with them which can slow down your page load time. And they're also dynamic, so it makes it harder for um, this page to be cached because these numbers are always changing. Uh, minimize image use, and I put a little asterisk next to that because images are obviously really good on post lists for engaging visitors and getting them to read the content. Um, but use thumbnails if you can, um, and again, if you're really concerned about page load time, you could consider totally removing them. Um, the other thing, of course, is to paginate results. If you have, you know, a hundred results on a page, it's um, better for your visitor, and better for the page load time to have, you know, maybe 10 or 20 or less um, on your page. And uh, the final point here is to create a mobile version of your website. Um, you know, when we think about speed optimization, a, a lot of us think about it in the desktop environment, but downloading a web page over 3G or 4G, um, it, 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 page load times become a lot more exaggerated. Um, it becomes a lot more frustrating experience for your visitors. So what you want to do is you want to create a unique design with unique mobile optimized CSS for your website. Um, you can use JavaScript browser discovery to discover the type of browser and then redirect the visitor to your mobile optimized site. Um, you can also use something called media query and responsive design. Um, and basically what that does is it detects the size of your browser and serves content based on the size of the browser. Um, subdomains are optional. You don't have to do you know, mobile.mydomain or m.mydomain. Um, Google specifically has a crawler for mobile optimized websites and they can detect when you have mobile optimized CSS. And then another thing, just in terms of the flat user experience, not necessarily the page load time, is that when you have form fields, you can actually, and I have a link to this resource here, you can actually optimize the type of keyboard that's shown um, to the visitor. So if you're doing a name, for example, you would use the title tag, which would essentially capitalize the first letter of each word. An email tag would allow you to have the keyboard with the at symbol, um, the dot com uh, shortcut, and things like that. Uh, but that's another great way to improve the user experience in terms of speed and filling out your forms. Um, just makes it easier for them to enter that content. Um, here's a few plugins that you can actually use that will help you automate, um, you know, mobile optimizing your site. Uh, I personally, we all we do it from hand, essentially hand coding the CSS. Um, but if that's not within your bailiwick and you don't have a development resource, um, there's a few plugins that you can try there. So again, just to kind of recap, um, use webpagetest.org to set a baseline, um, get a CDN, get a good host, um, you know, optimize your images, mobile optimize your website, and then think long and hard about plugins and the use of JavaScript on your site because those can be um, kind of red herrings for problems with your page load time. So. Awesome, thank you, David. So basically, I'd like to take this moment and really, uh, Willie has a presentation as well, but I think we should talk about why um, the speed is important on this. So um, both of you have uh, drastically increased uh, the speed load times for your clients, but all of us know that uh, when you visit a website and it's slow, it's a bad user experience, right? So my background, um, I've been an affiliate since uh, 2007, and we have our own uh, in-house uh, system that we, like, we track everything. We have our own tracking system for a long time, we worked with WordPress, and uh, what we noticed is when we would get a, a site ranking, like everyone knows that there's like SEO benefits to having a fast website, but uh, you were saying that uh, there's a video out there with Matt Cutts where he's actually saying that um, somewhere around only one out of a thousand sites is really impacted by, 
page load time, it's the, all the other benefits of having a fast site versus a slow site that really impact you. So something that uh, we really noticed in our, our data, I don't have any, it's not statistically like relevant or, or statistically significant, but what we've found is that sites that have like a bounce rate over 60 to 70 percent, um, when they're on page one, especially when they're in the first position, will often drop down. We'll see a, a drastic drop. So, um, and the biggest thing that impacts uh, the bounce rate is your speed load time. So at the end, after Willie's presentation, we'll go into all the small details, but when you're thinking like, I'm a blogger, what is speed really, how does it impact me? All of this uh, like really applies to the customer experience and how, how you, it, all of this ties together to your rankings. So Willie's presentation is a little bit more technical, but he's gonna go into uh, really how to optimize your site. So I'll pull that up. All right. Good afternoon. Um, again, my name is Willie Jackson, and I'm here talking to you now. Again, I run uh, the performance team at W3Edge, and so I put food on my table by making websites faster. This obviously has a lot of relevance at a conference like this because, um, you know, the sites convert better when your pages are loading. So we're going to walk through some of the philosophy behind uh, why W3TotalCache exists, the approach to a performance methodology, and some things that you can take away and just keep in mind as you're uh, not only doing things yourself and experimenting, but, um, you know, engaging other resources to assist on this journey. So I'm with W3Edge right now. I'm former CTO of Seth Godin's Domino Project, and uh, a little on my background, I was an IT consultant for uh, Accenture, and I got tired of the... Um, that adventure. So I transitioned into freelance web design and development, and I discovered the world of web performance optimization when I inherited a fast-growing growing blog. And I remember being on conference calls and restarting Apache, and um, it was an adventure. So I transitioned to that full time, and, and that was a lot of fun, um, and it was a lot more interesting than, you know, building websites based on screenshots of Chris Brogan's blog ripped off and pasted into PowerPoint for me. So um, just followed some different adventures and I enjoy what I do quite a bit. So after I finished with Domino in uh, 2011, I transitioned to a role with W3Edge and um, here we are making the web a faster place, hopefully. So laying, laying the foundation, as we talked about before, the case for fast websites has been, has been made a long time ago. You know, it's, it's been shown why we care about having a fast website. And it's not so much a case of whether or not you should care, it's how much you can afford not to care at this point. So uh, these are WordPress-centric points, but these apply to any PHP-based content management system. So if you have other content management systems or other applications that you run your websites on, like Nick does, these things are relevant as well. The key here is PHP. So in thinking about our web performance methodology, everything we're trying to do wraps around these points. We're trying to reduce execution time, literally how long it takes to do something. We want to prevent requests from hitting the application server, and we can touch on that if it doesn't make any more if it doesn't make any sense to you. And using a persistent data store whenever possible. The last item I touch on here is caching output for all unauthenticated users. Uh, does any of this sound like anything related to English for anyone here, or are we uh, all lost? No English. Wonderful. All right. So. I'll walk through this in plain English. Reducing execution time is nothing more than making sure that everything that happens when a page load happens as fast as possible. If you have a big uh, rotating image slider at the top of your website, then that's going to take some time to load. If you have uh, calls to third-party APIs and ad servers like David was talking about, that's going to take some time to load and it's going to cause your website to um, it's going to cause your website to hang sometimes. So for example, if a service is unavailable, if the Twitter API is down and you have a widget in the side of your website that has your latest tweets, then it's going to cause your website to take longer to load. People are not going to be willing to wait. And depending on where that code is inserted on your page, it could cause the rest of your content not to load. So there are a lot of things you want to think about when you're considering execution time and the implications of a fast loading website. Uh, preventing requests from hitting the application server, that was probably a terrible point to put in for this cloud. All it means is we want to add layers of caching. And in this case, we're talking about a caching plugin like W3 Total Cache. A persistent data store is literally what the caching is doing. It's basically providing, one of the main things that we want to do in caching website is provide full page caching. So after the website is visited, generate a 
literally a static copy of that page and serve that to visitors when they come the next time. So WordPress works by uh, taking incoming requests, asking, asking the database for information, piecing this together and serving it to the visitor. If you're doing that a lot of times and your site gets a lot of traffic, that's literally what's causing the slowdown of your websites because of PHP, because of the interaction with the database. What you want to do with page caching in particular, which is the main, one of the main functions of W3 Total Cache, is um, save that, save that output. When it's done once, serve that to the next few people who come and invalidate that after a while. But for the most part, there's no reason to have a dynamic site like CNN does because we're not updating our news on the hour every hour. So is that a, a better version of what this means? Wonderful. And unauthenticated users is just users not logged in. So if we're not talking about a buddy press or we're not talking about something that has uh, logged in and registered users where you have to register in order to comment, there's no reason why we can't cache everything and serve people a static copy of these things. You don't have to, you don't have to know how to make all these things work at the code level, but understand that this is what we're doing and this is why we care about it. So some hard numbers. You guys might be familiar with these numbers. Google found that for every half a second of load time that's added, their search volume drops by 20%. Uh, I don't know that that stat always gets me every time. As for Yahoo, it's uh, less than that, and that results in a 5 to 9% drop in traffic. And Amazon, for every 100 milliseconds, um, they lose 1% of sales. So for a multi-billion dollar company, you can imagine uh, the implications of that. So I want to do a quick exercise. It's called count to the millisecond. And just kidding. All right. <laughs> this is fun, the formatting. Jump up here. If you give me one second. While Willie's doing that, I'll expand on a point that Nick made earlier with uh, the Matt Cutts video. And uh, Matt Cutts has done a lot of videos on page load time and its effect on SEO. And in one of the videos that Nick mentioned, um, he gave a, an interesting number. And, and people that do speed optimization love to quote how um, Google has a couple of blog posts where they came out and said, page load time has a direct impact on your search rankings, an algorithmic impact. But in this video, Matt Cutts does the math and basically says, hey, look, only one in 1,000 sites have to worry about that. Only one in 1,000 sites will have a direct algorithmic impact on your search rankings. And as a speed optimizer, you're like, well, geez, that's not a very good, um, that's not a really very good metric to try to prove your point that speed impacts SEO. And um, as Nick pointed out, there are some indirect influences that that page load time can have on your search rankings, specifically your bounce rate. If you think about it from Google's perspective, if they're serving your page and it's ranking high uh, for a search term and visitors are bouncing from that, that's a poor user experience, right? They don't want those pages to rank. So even though they didn't say, oh, you know, page A has a you know, 500 millisecond page load time and page B has two seconds, so we're gonna rank page A faster than B. That's not really the case, but if your page load times are too high and those users are bouncing, that will affect your rankings. The other thing that page load time will do in terms of affecting your rankings is personalized search. Um, personalized search, uh, we all know that when you log into Google, um, you probably experienced this, you're like, oh wow, my site's ranking number one for this search term, and you log out of Google and it's not ranking number one anymore, that's personalized search. And so personalized search can be impacted by page load times as well, because if your page load times are low and your visitors are bouncing or they're not engaged with your site or they're not having a good experience and sticking around and plus wanting it and liking it, um, then it's likely that they're not going to Ha or your site's not going to rank well in those personalized search results. So don't just think about it in terms of your uh, rank checker. Think about it also in terms of personalized search. Thanks. I appreciate your patience. I have some points that are better for this crowd. There's a technical version of this talk, obviously, and there's a um, one that I think we can make a little bit more relevant. So I, I appreciate your turbulence, and thank you. That was unscripted. David is wonderful. Um, so any system, the greatest performance is achieved through component specialization. In plain English, what that means is the philosophy we've taken in uh, using W3 Total Cash is not requiring you to understand all the things that I do for a living. It's basically understanding that the things that you need to know are in there if you want to use them, and the more you understand, the more you can access. So if we're talking about page caching like we just talked about, that's one of the settings that comes configured with W3 Total Cash to begin with. So you know it exists, you know what it does now, hopefully, 
and you can better grasp how it applies to your business and how you can use it uh, to increase uh, your success on the web. Again, it's all about PHP here, and this is what powers, I mean, we're married to PHP. It's a slow language, we, we're married to it, and we just have to deal with it. So, uh, effective web performance optimization starts with understanding it. It's the slowest component of the stack. So when we talk about the stack, what are we talking about? We're talking about Apache at the very top. We're talking about PHP. We're talking about the database. There's all these components that come together that generates the pages that we see when we browse the web. PHP is far and away the slowest component of the stack. So there's a lot of things we do in this philosophy to uh, deal with this. The layers of caching we're talking about, what are we talking about? We're talking about database caching. We're talking about object caching. We're talking about adding a content delivery network. We're talking about minifying and concatenating scripts. And we're even talking about some things like reverse proxies when you get into more advanced sites that require this for because, because of the level of traffic or because of your performance goal. So there's a lot of things that we can delve into. I won't, I'll, I'll breeze over them for now, but this is what goes into the thinking behind a web performance framework like W3 Total Cache. So the front end philosophy, David touched on some things very similar to this. Uh, make less, make it smaller, make it last, make it count. Uh, these cute phrases mean some pretty simple things. Make less, so if we can have less components on our web page, it's going to load faster. An HTTP request is nothing but a request from the browser to the server that sends you a component of the website. This could be a CSS file, this could be a JavaScript file, and if you want to think about a correlation, the more plugins you add, the more HTTP requests you're often going to, that are often going to result from this. Um, the thing that I'd make relevant here is add we, as we're adding these plus one buttons, as we're adding the Twitter widgets, as we're adding the Facebook like boxes, these things are notoriously bad for performance. Not only because they're hitting third party APIs, literally servers that we don't control and can't optimize, but sometimes these APIs are unavailable. So that negatively impacts our load times because we're waiting on these things and we don't know if they're available. So I'd encourage you to be very discriminating about the things that you integrate on your sites. It's easy to add plugins. Uh, Dig was popular at one time. There's a lot of things we can add to encourage social sharing, but understand the implications on web performance. Uh, make it smaller. What are we talking about there? We're talking about gzip compression for the most part. You don't have to know what it is, but just understand that it makes it something smaller. When you're, uh, when you're sending vacation photos to a relative, uh, you know, you don't just send all the big files. You zip them up. The same uh, concept exists at the server level, and it's called gzip compression. It's something that you can enable just with a, a checkbox in W3 Total Cache or other caching plugins there. You can do it by hand. Uh, you can literally open up um, it's, it's, there's a directory level configuration file called an htaccess file. I'm sure we've all broken that once or twice uh, in our time building websites. But there are some directives, some, literally some settings we can drop in there that add gzip compression. But my point here is to make you aware of it. We want to make all the components smaller. Start with the fewest components possible. Make the ones that exist smaller. Making it last. Uh, this is not relationship therapy. What I'm talking about is adding far, far future expires. So there are cache control and expires headers that exist. Literally some instructions that are sent along with your static assets that say, hang on to this for a long time. What am I talking about? When we visit a site for the first time, it's going to load and our browser is going to say, okay, I understand what this page is made of. The next time we come to that site, it's going to load a lot faster because our browser remembers some of those components. What we can do is encourage, we can send instructions along with these CSS and images uh, and JavaScript assets that say, tell browsers, hang on to this for a long time. It's not going to change. Just save it locally. And the next time a user visits this site, just serve it locally. So instead of requesting something from the server again, you can request a local copy. Does that make sense? So that's make it last. And make it count. These are things like not having any 404s on your page. Uh, one of, the one, one of the web performance rules, I'll try this in English, one of the web performance rules is reducing DNS lookups. And the way, to, the way you really need to worry about this is make sure that the components loaded on a page are served from one host name, so migrateaffiliatewebsite.com. If we're loading assets from the Twitter uh, API, if we're loading from Facebook fan pages and things like this, these are other host names, literally domain names, that need to be checked with in order to assemble your page. Does that make sense? So, the smaller number of resources we can require to assemble our pages, the faster it's going to work. We're still talking about physics. We're still dealing with the speed of light. So these things uh, we need to take into consideration when we're making it count. Um, as it relates to rankings and conversion optimization, we want to reduce things like 404s. Things within our control, we always, want to we always want to mitigate as much as possible. And in this case, reducing 404s is a great way um, to avoid having your SEO penalized. 
Um, as marketers, we all understand that our work is never done. As web performance optimization experts, uh, we're never done either. The key here is to measure, analyze, and monitor. So we measure our performance with tools like web page tests. There's another one I'd like you to learn about called gtmetrics.com, G-T-M-E-T-R-I-X.com. One of the cool things about GT Metrics is it allows you to register for an account and measure the performance of your site over time. So I've got a little checker that goes to my website every week and it shows me a graph over time of how fast my site has been. If I correlate that data with um, changes I've made to my website or just trends on the web or how my hosting company is doing, I can start to extrapolate some information on what I need to do, some better strategic moves uh, for my company, for my business, and ultimately for my clients. In analyzing these things, we're looking at the waterfall, we're looking at the breakdown of components on the page. Uh, Google now manage, Google now, oh, it's nomenclature. We can use Google to manage web, web page uh, speed. So it's one of the components that's uh, measurable inside of your Google Analytics panel. So we have some data there that shows you how you rank up, how you rank against others and how fast we need to be. This is also available to you in the Google Webmaster Tools. And monitoring. This gets a little advanced, but uh, just something for you to write down for your developer, your engineer. There's an application called New Relic, and so there are different tools that allow you to, at the application level, literally how PHP is running, how it's interacting with the database, what's causing the bottlenecks, what's causing the slowdowns. We care about this as our websites grow and as we start uh, adding more resources to them and as we start getting more traffic, because at some point we can't just scale vertically, which would be a bigger server, more memory, bigger hard drive, things like that we're at some point going to want to scale horizontally, which means adding more servers and things like that. So at that point, you really need to have an idea of what's going on. Is there a question? Certainly. Uh, New Relic was the last one. It, it's just spelled how it sounds, N-E-W-R-E-L-I-C. And the, um, analyze, the measuring tool I would recommend that you check out is GT Metrics, G-T-M-E-T-R-I-X.com. You can just enter your website there, and it will it'll run a test on it. So the W3 total cash approach uh, to web performance. It's a web performance framework. So instead of just thinking it, of it as, this, isn't a, this is not just an advertisement for the plugin, this is the philosophy and how it's been extracted into the, the um, just the way that the plugin was built. So I wouldn't just think about it as a plugin and a little history on it. It was built from lessons learned in scaling Mashable. So my business partner, the CEO of W3 Edge, uh, Frederick Towns, he was responsible and he was the founding CTO of Mashable and he was responsible for taking it to a growing and popular site to what it is today which everybody knows about. So how many of you use Basecamp or have heard of it at least? So uh, are you familiar with Ruby on Rails? So David Heinemar Hansen is a developer out of Copenhagen. He's, he's from Copenhagen actually and for 10 hours a week he was working on the Basecamp project many many years ago. And through the process of building Basecamp, he realized that there was a repeatable set of methods to handle things at the coding level that made his life simpler. He took these lessons and abstracted this away into a framework for web development called Ruby on Rails. And that's the parallel I would draw here for uh, what W3 Total Cache represents to the WordPress world in lessons learned in scaling Mashable. We're talking about dozens of servers. We're talking about literally optimizing every single thing that ships with WordPress that comes with servers uh, thinking it from the ground up, what we can do to make it faster, what we can do to reduce the memory footprint, and ultimately increasing our subscribers and conversions. How are we doing on time? Okay. Um, and again, we're not, our goal is not to make caching sexy, because that's impossible, but it's important, so we provide you with a, a framework for understanding why it's important and what you can do about it. So what we're W3 Total Cache doing is, again, providing a persistent data store, and the modularity, in plain English, all that means is there are different components of the plugin and there are different aspects of web performance tuning that you can be aware of. And the more you know, the more you can do. So when we're talking about page caching, when we're talking about CDN integration, you can start to sign up for these services. It doesn't have to be an all or nothing thing. And truly, a lot of what I've learned has been from trial and error in the process of learning web performance, understanding, getting my brain around certain concepts, page caching, minify, concatenation, and applying those to my website. Experimenting, breaking something, experimenting, breaking something, and hopefully uh, you outrun that cycle after a while. Your website becomes faster, and you know, when you first get that little uh, improvement in your Google page speed test, it's really, really gratifying, of course, and your visitors will thank you. 
Um, so some perspective. This could be a lot easier. We're dealing with really dated technologies on the web. The web was not designed for what we're doing from a performance perspective, from a design perspective. It's really amazing how far we've come with these technologies that are outdated and not designed to do what we're supposed to do with them. And we could make assumptions in our performance uh, tuning that would make automatic optimization of websites a lot simpler. But what you find, in my perspective as, as a performance engineer, is that's the best way to cause some problems in the long term. If you have a site that you've been building for a while and it starts to get some traction, the same considerations you make when you're getting 1,000 hits a day are completely different from the same considerations you're uh, going to make when you're getting 10,000 hits a day or 10,000 hits an hour. Um, and that scale exists, and those things happen overnight in some cases. So. Uh, our goal is not to make small improvements. Our goal in these web performance philosophies is to really prepare you to scale um, by an order of magnitude. So some takeaways, some things that you can write down if you'd like some performance plugins and some optimization plugins to look into. CW Image Optimizer is an in interesting project I'm looking at. It requires a bit of uh, configuration on a server, so you'd need like a um, a VPS to which you have root access or a dedicated server because you need to install some server software. One of the reasons I mentioned is because WP Smush It was previously one of my favorite plugins, but it's been unreliable for us lately and it, it just causes some problems for some visitors. So try it out, see if you have some, see, see if you have some issues with it. But this is a project that I'm, I'm personally bookmarking to see if they make it easy for the end user and it does a great job of what it does. So if you need help, just ask. Uh, WP Optimize is a great plugin that uh, will optimize your database table. So after a while, after you experiment with some plugins, they leave settings. Sometimes plugins don't clean up after themselves. We all know that the database grows, database grows. So WP Optimize is a great way to clean things out. There's another one. The plugin hasn't been updated for a while, so use it at your own risk. But just to make you aware of it, it's called Clean Options. And it's something that will look for what you call orphaned uh, database tables, basically settings that no longer correspond to anything active in WordPress anymore. And it will attempt to clean those out. It actually provides a mechanism for you to Google uh, literally the database entry so you can get a sense for whether or not you actually need these things. And you can remove them. So. WP Optimize is a great plugin for you to use. I, and just a best practice, I wouldn't keep it active. I wouldn't keep any plugin active on your site that you're not actively using. So if it's something on and that it runs a function on your website, that's when I would keep it active. That's what I'd run it and then I would um, put it back to bed. P3 Plugin Performance Profiler is a plugin that I use every day in my performance tuning and analyzing. It's basically a plugin. It's really cool. It's created by GoDaddy, actually. And it's something that will let you know how much of the execution time of a page is being used by your plugins. So there's some notorious ones. Um, I won't name names, but there's some plugins notorious for bad performance. This is a really great way of seeing what's eating up all of your execution time and literally how much of your page load time is being used by uh, plugins that are running. So a really useful one that I use every day. Uh, even in the affiliate and SEO world, I see some customers using three and four different SEO plugins. Uh, don't do that. Just use WordPress SEO. It does everything you need. Uh, Image Optim is a desktop piece of software for Mac that will actually run an optimization and losslessly compress all of your images. So if you have images for your posts that are going up, you can just drop them in there. It'll perform an optimization on them, and you can actually optimize it a couple times until the image is smaller, until it strips away unnecessary metadata, and it looks wonderful. Uh, photo credits, and um, this is my contact information. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Nick. You can interrupt me. I should have said this earlier. You can interrupt me at any time if you have any questions, but i um, happy to take your questions now. So the question was, uh, is there a rule of thumb for how many plugins you should be using? Uh, in your experience, what do you guys think? As few as possible, um, you know, obviously. Um, you know, again, thinking about it, and I keep making this analogy to the GeoCities example where you have lots of animated parts of your, web, your website and it looks ugly and takes a long time to load. I mean, plugins are certainly very valuable and can provide shortcuts for functions. Um, but I wouldn't say that the limit is 10 or 20 or 30. I mean, the limit is, is as few as possible to accomplish what you need to accomplish on the website. Um, so, so no hard number for me, Willie. And you? No, it's, it's a really tough question because some plugins are, are really valuable. There are certain things that should exist in the, 
should exist in the WordPress core that don't. Like, why do we have to install a plugin to have a contact form, for example? You need one. So you don't want, you don't ever want to get to the point where that's on the chopping block. I would take less of a look at the number and more of a look at the functionality. So if you're doing things that add a little cute widget over here and, you know, a, a dancing Twitter icon, then maybe be more discriminating about that. But <clears throat> I, would, I would just take it seriously. The things I would look for are um, the ratings. Are a lot of people saying that this is a solid plugin? Is it, by, is it created by a reputable author who has five, six, ten, twelve plugins to his name? Um, are they affiliated with an agency or something that has some clout in the industry? Can you Google their name and find out who they are? I would do some investigation and some research before adding a plugin or just ask around. So, you know, we see some sites with, you know, 40 some odd plugins, but all, all sites are not created equal. If you're on a VPS with plenty of RAM, we're storing all these things in memory, <clears throat> then it's completely different than maybe you adding five plugins on GoDaddy. Like that could, you know, 10, site, 10 plugins on a GoDaddy, $3 a month plan, that's going to bring the sites to its knees. But if I build you a server and you have a bunch of plugins, then you're not necessarily going to feel that same impact. So I don't have a, a straightforward number for you, but I'm, I'm more trying to get you in the mindset of why you should be discriminating and what we should be caring about when you're thinking about it. Is that helpful? Great. Awesome. So we'll jump into Q&A right now. And then um, if we still have time, I, we didn't talk about this, but maybe it would be interesting to jump in and actually like see someone's uh, site and see the waterfall and how to look at that and what to look for. So let's, let's go ahead and take the two questions we had. So uh, the question I have is if we're looking at Google uh, tools, what's it, can we see a page being in frame? I think that's good. I agree with what you're saying. But if we get a, you know, like a green one uh, off of that, are we okay? And for, so page 24, I mean, you say, well, we're never done. But it's really hard for you. So just to re repeat the question for video, um, basically he was asking in Google Webmaster Tools, once, uh, once you get a green or a good uh, on your speed, are you good to go? Um, it c depends on your competitors, of course, the sites that you're competing against. If they have very fast page load times, you might want to take that into consideration even though you're showing up as green. Um, you know, generally speaking, the faster your page loads, the better experience the customer is going to have, which is going to result in stickier customers um, and better conversion rates. But, you know, again, if you're under that two-second level, if you go to webpagetest.org um, or other speed tools and you're under that two-second level, you're probably pretty good. So other specifics for uh, codecs to render videos faster, you guys recommend? Uh, I'm not a huge video guy personally, so I'm probably not the best person to answer that question. Will no, it's, I don't think it's the codec that matters so much as how fast it's being served as a component of the page. So just one of the things, if you're going to host it on a third-party site like Vimeo or blip.tv or something like that, then do that. If you're self-hosting the video, then use a service like uh, MacCDN or... Amazon Cloud Front to serve it. So you basically want it to be served as fast as possible, and you want that to be cached along with your page content. So that's how I would do it. But I don't have any recommendations on a specific codec. Well, so the question is, uh, do you need to take the make the file size as small as possible perspective into that? No, not with video. Video is not required to load all at once, thankfully. So the length of the video doesn't matter so much as how fast that initial frame loads. So if it's, if it's got to go and ask YouTube for the thumbnail and things like that, then that's what to consider, take into consideration. Perfect example, if you have a new WordPress blog, uh, take a performance test, use web page test, use GT metrics or something like that, and then embed a YouTube video on that home page post and look how the performance is negatively impacted by that. So that's the kind of thing to keep in mind and that's one of the reasons that I would self-host the video. I would serve it from a content delivery network like Amazon CloudFront that makes it really easy. For me, I, I say that because I'm an engineer. I'd use something like Amazon CloudFront and I'd use like a, a static image as my first frame uh, for that thumbnail. So those are just some tactics I would use. But you don't have to worry about the file size. My site is apparently posted on the post. Can you tell, and I'm concerned that I'm starting out, how beyond this speed, like is there a point where you can't see
It's it's really burstability, right? It's depending. Oh, sorry. Yeah, to repeat the question for the video. Um, uh, the, uh, sorry, uh, the question was, you know, at what point do you need to move beyond a shared host like Bluehost? At what percentage of traffic or volume of traffic does it make sense to move to a VPS or dedicated server? Um, so it really depends on burstability, right? If you get on the front page of Mashable or TechCrunch or something like that, you're going to get slammed with a lot of traffic and you're going to discover real quickly whether or not Bluehost is going to uh, fit the bill or not. Um, you know, if you're planning on, if, you're, if your plan is to have 30, 50 hits a day, then you're probably pretty safe. Um, but obviously if, if you're taking traffic strategies where you're buying traffic or doing like social media marketing where you're going to have a huge influx of traffic, that's when it's going to hurt. Um, our agency sites, so we're not, you know, doing these huge publications where we're expecting millions of visitors, like we have really kind of small volume of traffic relative to the overall size of the internet. Um, our site, last affiliate summit, was brought down for three days on a shared hosting environment because of a denial of service attack. Um, so even though we didn't get a huge influx of traffic, uh, the denial of service attack ended, us, ended up causing us to go down. We subsequently moved to a dedicated environment, but um, essentially what happened was um, it was totally beyond our control. And when we moved it to the other environment, we just served the traffic. Um, we actually took us a few more uh, days to stop the denial of service attack. So it's not just the spikes in traffic, it's these like things that you can't control that will also impact. That was what we had one point before I went to Bluehost. My site was down for almost two weeks because of things that I could not control. Right. And so when I moved over to Bluehost, I was able to control the traffic because I was able to control the traffic. And so I was able to control the traffic because I was able to control the traffic. And so I was able to control the traffic because I was able to control the traffic. And so I was able to control the traffic because I was able to control the traffic. And so I was able to control the traffic because I was able to control the traffic. And so I was able to control the traffic because I was able to control the traffic. And so I was able to control the traffic because I was able to control the traffic. And so I was able to control the traffic because I was able to control the traffic. And so I was able to control the traffic because I was able to control the traffic. And so I was able to control the traffic because I was able to control the Sorry, I can add some. I can add some. So, some context for for this in general. If you want to zoom out a little bit, one of the things about shared hosting that's a draw a drawback is your performance is contingent upon the activity of the other sites that live on the server. So, if somebody else is getting some traffic at Affiliate Summit, or David is you know sending them a lot of traffic because he doesn't like you, then your site's going to suffer as a result because there are a finite amount of resources that exist on ex on servers and nodes at one time, and you know. The business is put as many websites as possible there and oversell your servers. It's just like you know airlines and everything else. It's a business. So keep that in mind. The thing I would do just in defensive preparation is always keep uh, daily backups of your site. If you have that, then you can transfer your site anywhere at just about any time, right? So if you have a latest uh, database backup and you have your static content that you pull down via FTP or by using a plugin that I'd recommend called VaultPress, um, then you can always transfer your site anywhere. Uh, very, very quickly with, to, with anywhere that knows how to, um, with any WordPress host basically. Um, and the other thing I would, I would keep in mind is just what it takes, what the differences are, the pros and cons in having a shared hosting versus a VPS or dedicated box. I prefer VPSs because I'm more in control of everything in the stack and the promise for the hosting company is that they'll keep the site up. It's my responsibility to handle everything else, but with shared hosting you're really at the mercy of a lot of things that don't make me sleep well at night. So. Um, and Maybe to expand on Willie's point, when we had our denial of service attack, it took down 50 other websites. Um, so it wasn't just ours that had the problem. Are you all familiar with uh, Cloudflare? Cloudflare is a uh, DNS and proxying server. Let me try to speak English. Cloudflare makes your site faster and it makes your site more secure. And one of the things they do is they uh, route your DNS for you. So at the network level, they're able to mitigate things like denial of service attacks. Are we all familiar with what that is? It's basically where somebody or you know, a malicious set of servers, it's basically an attack on a website or a web point where a lot of traffic is sent to overload the resources there and nobody can reach the website. So you see, hear about these hacking groups like Anonymous. If they want to cause some real problems for a website, they'll just send it a ton of traffic so no one can reach it. That's just a distributed denial of service attack. It's really geeky stuff, but the way to protect against it is by using services like Cloudflare or at least being aware from them. Of them. Yeah, we had a million page requests per hour um, during our denial of service attack. So. Um. When you spoke about uh, expires, uh, the question is about how you'd set expires. Uh, there are several plugins that allow you to do it. So, uh, one is just knowing the term expires headers. And um, the way I would implement it, obviously, is with W3 Total Cache. You go to the browser cache settings, and it's just a checkbox there. Um, other plugins do it. You can choose the plugin that you'd like, but um, there's a lot of plugins that make it easy. So you can Google something like WordPress expires headers or WordPress um, 
browser caching plugin, but I would use W3 Total Cache. Go to browser cache settings and just enable expires headers. It's uh, pretty simple. You shouldn't have to worry about how to do it. That's right. So it's in W3 Total Cache, it's set by uh, a, a time in the future. And the way you have control over this is by um, expiring the browser cache. So that's the way it's set. By default, it's set in there already for you. And there are different ways to do it. So you, there's, for example, access plus one month or access plus 10 years. That's literally the setting that you put in the HT access file if you're running Apache to set a far future expires date. But you don't have to worry about those specific things if you're using a plugin that's designed to help you implement browser caching, if that makes sense. Those settings exist in there for you. That's correct. Sure. Far away. I mean, it depends on this. So the question was, um, he has a bunch of uh, images that are linking to third-party resources, and um, they were widgets, and he changed them to HTML to link directly to those resources, and whether that was going to slow the site down. Don't, don't be afraid to link to other resources with images. Um, you know, at some point, you have to take into account, um, you know, getting your point across to your visitors, displaying the content that's going to be necessary for them to get the information that they need. Um, Yeah, I mean, we're, we're talking about the, and the gentleman mentioned that he was scared that, you know, re, that he had a lot of things on the website and that he needed to reduce them. Um, you know, it's not, when we get up here and we talk about speed and we talk about minimizing and reducing things on the website, like there's a giant asterisk, asterisk next to it. Um, if, it if, you, if you need that information, if you need that image to convey that message, do it. Um, you know, the point is to use optimized images and to try to stay away from widgets and dynamic things like Willie was talking about, tying into third-party APIs. Um, just be cognizant of those things. If your page load time is under two seconds and you've got these elements on your site, you're probably okay. Um, just be cognizant that they might cause problems and that if you do have page load times over two seconds, that these are things that you can optimize to reduce that. But um, don't be afraid to use images. Don't be afraid to use these things. Just be aware that if your page load times are too slow or you're using third-party APIs, you can be opening the door um, to problems in the future. So um, don't, don't get paralyzed with fear over adding things to your website. If I could add a little color there, there's a difference between uh, widgets that add dynamic counters literally something that says this has been liked 52 times, that's, a difference, that's different from sharing something on Facebook, right? So if you see the latest number of tweets or likes, that's obviously something that's making a call to another service. If you've just coded up a plugin or some functionality that pushes it out to that service, there's no, there's no corresponding uh, impact on web performance in the way that a dynamic call to a service that has a counter would. So if you configure a Twitter button, for example, you can configure it to show the latest number of likes, or whatever tweets. Twitter does, tweets. <laughs> uh, right, so the only point I'm making is that there's a difference between something that pushes it out to Twitter and something that shows people also how many times it's been tweeted because that's the one that's interacting with the API and that's where your latency is coming from. So we have time for one more quick question and then we have to wrap up, but right over here.
You should create that tool. Can you take that one? Pull up um, Google Chrome and Waterfall. If you want to take the question, or I'll show something as well. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure I fully understood the question. So, so basically, the, the question was: Is, is there a, a plugin out there that shows you how many, uh, which which plugins are using the most DNS lookups, to and which ones are slowing you down? He said that there were some plugins that are using multiple, like requesting data from multiple places. And is there a way to easily figure that out? And if not, like disable it, or if so, disable it. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not personally aware of that. Uh, I'm not sure if Willie has anything he's going to expand on here with the waterfall view. So, um, Willie's pulling up Waterfall right now, yeah. which is uh, what he referenced in his uh, first slide, and it basically shows you how fast everything is. I'm sure Willie's got something sweet on this. Well, so, to answer your question, no, there's no way, there's no service that does that right now. But the way we can tell is by using something like Firefox or Firebug to inspect the Waterfall. So, if I open up CNN.com, oh, this might not even have, this isn't going to have Firebug. <laughs> Use console in Chrome. Chrome. Use console in Chrome. Uh, type, type. So if you look in the top right, you see waiting for Facebook. That's really, uh, that kind of proves so many of the points that we're talking about. So instead of showing the data that we're waiting on, it's trying to contact Facebook and request some resources from that. We've got CNN.com open, and we've pulled up some really nerdy tools that are baked into CNN. And the page hasn't completely loaded because we're waiting on assets from, um, from Facebook. And if you look at the cursor, you see it's still loading. So these things negatively impact your performance time. And these are the, like, this is a perfect example of a site that cares a lot about getting very uh, quickly to visitors, but that's negatively impacted by the limitations of the technology and things like that. I remember at one point when we were checking, I think we're out of time, at one point when we were checking, a Facebook like box adds 42 HTTP requests. So 42 trips back and forth to the server are required in order to show your latest friends that you don't want to talk to from high school. Cool. So that's pretty much time. Um, these guys will be up here to answer questions uh, after this. Uh, have a great rest of your day. Yeah, thank you, everyone.